You know, this past Thursday was Ascension Day, a day in the liturgical calendar that most of us forget about. And that's probably my fault because I don't bring it up and we don't have a special service for it. But I find it interesting that the day that we remember the ascension of Jesus, that after he had risen from the grave, he ascended to the right hand of God, where he sits upon his throne and rules and reigns over the world, where he sits as our great high priest in the holiest of holies, offering up prayers and petitions on our behalf that we often don't remember the day that celebrates this moment in our salvation. I mean, think about it for a moment. Christmas Eve, the day in which we remember the incarnation, the night of holiness and awe that God would become man and dwell among us. It, it dictates our cultural calendar and our liturgical calendar. Or think about Holy Week for a moment, the high point of the church season, the church calendar. We begin with the triumphal entry of Christ on Palm Sunday. We remember the service of Christ on Monday, Thursday. We remember the crucifixion of Christ on Good Friday. We remember his resurrection on Easter Sunday. It's by far the most important liturgical week of the year. Or next week is what? Does anyone know what's coming up next week? It's Pentecost, the day in which we remember the Descent of the dove upon the church, the descent of the Holy Spirit to send us out in mission. And yet, Ascension Day is relegated to a Thursday, and we almost always forget about it. But the point I would like to make today is this, family. The Ascension is just as central as the Incarnation. The ascension is just as central as the crucifixion. The ascension is just as central as the resurrection. Because in the ascension, the work of Christ is complete. Without the ascension, there is no kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God requires a king. And where is Christ reigning? At the right hand of God. If he did not ascend, he is not reigning. Not only that, but if he didn't ascend then our prayers, our worship goes nowhere. You know, you don't have direct access to God the Father. You have mediated access to God the Father through your great high priest, God the Son. And unless he is sitting at the right hand of his Father, perfecting our prayers and worship, they're going nowhere. Outside of the ascension, we are still left in our sins and alienated from God. But thanks be to God. That's not our story. Thanks be to God, our Savior ascended to the right hand of God where he reigns over the earth and where he serves as our great high priest. Today, what I want to do is remind us of just how central this truth is to our lives. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. And like I said, there are two primary images of Christ being seated at the right hand of the Father. There is a priestly image that he's offering up prayers and petitions on our behalf to our Father in heaven. And we covered that for an entire year. That was called the book of Hebrews, if you remember it. That's the entire theme of the book of Hebrews. Today, I want to primarily cover the reality that we have a king who rules at the right hand of God. I want to look at the kingship of Christ, most notably the fact that he rules over the earth and he rules over his church. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe." according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule 
and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. First, I want to look at this reality that the ascension reminds us that there is one king over the world. There is one ruler over creation, and that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 19 says, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. This is a truth that we all need to remember, family, because so often we wonder, is Christ really ruling over this world? Because it appears so often like he's not. It appears so often like evil is winning, that those who propagate unrighteousness seem to be blessed while those who follow Christ are persecuted again and again. Is he really in control? And yet we recognize that as the second person of the Trinity, the divine Lagos, he is the only one who has authority and the right to reign over creation. And yet so often we need to be reminded of this truth, especially when tragedy hits. Because when tragedy hits, we ask the question, if God was really in control, why would he let this terrible thing happen to me? If God was really in control, why would he allow these terrible people who have wronged me or, or this disease that has taken away a loved one or taken away my health, why on earth would he allow this to happen? So often we get stuck in this tension. Either God is in control or God loves me, but they can't both be true at the same time. That's what we tell ourselves, right? Because if God was in control and he loved me, then he wouldn't let this happen to me. So clearly he's not in control. Or uh, if he is in control and he allowed this bad thing to happen to me, then he clearly doesn't love me. And he might have control and power over me, but clearly he's not the benevolent God that I'm taught about in the Bible. You know, this struck me in probably the most difficult pastoral season of my life. And I've shared this story before, but I'll share it again. When my cousins got killed, you all know that story. Annie and Caroline, they were like my little sisters. The first gift I ever bought was I gave $2 to Annie on her second birthday. I loved them. And they were killed in a reckless car driving accident. And a few of you blessed me and flew me out to go be with my family right after the girls died. And I was a newly ordained priest. I was 29. And of course, being the priest in the family, my aunt immediately wanted to talk to me. She pulled me aside and she said, Timmy, because my family calls me Timmy, Timmy, my pastor says that God is mourning with us, that he didn't want this to happen. And she looked at me and she said, Tim, if God didn't want this to happen, if he's not in control, then who is? How can this be made right? How can there be a happy ending to this tragedy at all? In that moment, I realized a point that has never left me and the point that I communicated to her. The scriptures teach us two truths that we must hold. That God is both in control and he is the one that loved us so much that he died in our place. He is in control and he is the one that loved us so much he sent his son to die for us. The rulership of Christ ultimately is a word of comfort because it reminds us 
that the one who is guiding all things to his good and perfect purposes is also the one who loved us so much that he endured the cross on our behalf. And when the ground shakes under your feet, and at some point it will, you will be tempted to believe one of these is true, but they can't both be true. Either he loves me, and he's not in control, and if that's the case, then who is in control? Evil is an equal power to God. And where does that leave us? It leaves us in despair. Because if he's not in control, there is absolutely no guarantee that there's a happy ending to this story. Or he is in control, and we say, well, if he's in control, then he doesn't love me, and Tim's been lying to me all these years. And in those moments, you need to come to the Eucharist table in which Jesus says, I loved you this much that I poured out my very blood for you. The one who rules and reigns over the world is also the one who spilt his very blood on our behalf, and therefore we can trust him, and we look to him as our authority with eyes of faith. First, the rulership of Christ is a word of comfort. But second, the rule of Christ over the entire world is also a word of conviction. Because if he rules over all authority, all power, all dominion, if everything is under his feet, then you're included in that. Not only is his rulership a word of comfort, family, it's also a word of conviction. That we are not our own, but belong body and soul to our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, if he rules over all things, then he rules over the content of your conversations. If he rules over all things, then he rules over your workplace habits. If he rules over all things, then he rules over your browsing history. If he rules over all things, then he even rules over your family. If he rules over all things, then he rules over your marriage. If he rules over all things, then he ultimately rules over your political convictions. If he rules over all things, he rules over all parts of your life. This is what the reformers called living quorum Deo, living in the very presence of God. And to live in the very presence of God is an incredible gift because you can always be with God. But also to live in the very presence of God is a profound responsibility because he's always with you. And therefore, there is never a moment in which you escape his rulership over your life. The great Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper, you already know what I'm going to quote. He was also, by the way, the prime minister at the time. He said this, There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. And family, this fundamentally is the backdrop of discipleship that all of our lives belong to Christ. That if he has ascended and he rules over the earth, he rules over all parts of who you are. And next week, we are going to look at the sending of the Holy Spirit, and this is ultimately his work, family. That the Spirit would bring us under the rulership of Christ and transform us to love what our King loves. Who is a good royal subject? The subject who loves what the king loves, who has the same mind as the king, who serves the same purposes as the king, who has the same vision of the kingdom as the king. And yet so often I wonder if there are other voices in our lives that have a far greater impact on our day-to-day -day existence than our king. Think about it for a moment. Does the general milieu of the United States form your understanding of sexual desire more than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Does our modern capitalist culture teach you more about how you use your money 
than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Does the talking head on TV, that I still don't know why you all are listening to them, they're just manipulating you and trying to get your money. Does that person have more impact on how you see the poor or your neighbor who doesn't politically agree with you than the teachings of Jesus Christ? If he is Lord, then he is Lord over all parts of your life. In our ever-increasingly polarized world, all I see is that the lordship of the world is taking root in our lives rather than the lordship of Jesus. In our increasingly polarized world, why is it not that there is this third group of people saying, we already have a Lord, and his name is Jesus? We will inherently look different than the world when we recognize that we have a different king. And that is for the left, that is for the right, that is for the young, that is for the old, that is for male, that is for female. That is for all of us. Not only is the lordship of Christ a word of comfort, it's also a word of conviction. Now, not only is Jesus the Lord over the world, he is also Lord and head over the church. Look at verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. One of these days, I want to preach a sermon on verse 22, but I still don't fully understand it, except for that the church is a way bigger deal than we give it credit for. A way bigger deal than we give it credit for. All other social institutions will go away. The nuclear family is not going to be in heaven, by the way. It won't, but the church will. There is one institution, one community that lasts forever, and that's the body of Christ. And what we see here is that Christ is given as head over the church. We see this also impacted in Ephesians 5.23 and Colossians 1.18. And this is significant because the word head in the Greek, it's normally used in three ways, and they all complement each other, and yet they're all kind of distinct. So first, head can mean source, like a head waters. And that makes sense. Christ is the source of the church. He is the one who breathes forth the spirit that forms his body, the church. Or head can mean normally what we think, organizational head. He's the boss over the church. I am not. I am just a part of the body. I'm not the mouthpiece of the church. I'm not the brain of the church. He is. He's the, well, I'm going to get to that in a second. He's the head. And then it literally also means he's the head, meaning the thing that sits on your shoulders, this part of your body. Now, why is that important? What does the head do? What does this part of your body do? And that's clearly what's being referenced here because it talks about the body of Christ afterward. What does the head do? The head directs the body. The head is where the eyes and the ears and the mouth are stored, i.e. the places where you get information. And then the information is interpreted in the brain and signals are sent to your fingers and your toes and your arms and your legs. And the body responds to the direction of the head. And yet so often, what do our churches look like? They look like paralysis. Because what is paralysis? It's the brain sending signals, but the signal's not getting there. My mentor, Thad Barnum, was mentored by a man named Terry Fulham. And Terry Fulham was a brilliant uh, Episcopal priest. He was kind of the godfather of the Anglican movement. He was a former philosophy professor that became a priest. Uh, so he's kind of kind of a hero of mine, and he often taught on the headship of Christ over the church, and he became so well known for this that he started hosting conferences, and this woman from Texas wanted to come to the conference, and he said, sure, if she can get there, you know, she has a free pass. We're going to pay for everything. Okay, great, and she shows up, 
This is in the 70s, so I don't exactly know all of her physical ailments, but she's completely paralyzed from the neck down. And at this time, they didn't have the kind of wheelchairs that would allow her to be laid back, so she had to be brought in on a bed. And in the middle of a teaching in which Terry Fulham, who he's kind of like me, he kind of has a grating grating, somewhat humorous sounding voice. So he's talking and, you know, people are listening and all that. And she asks, could everyone look at me for a minute? She was in the back. Could everyone look? Her voice worked great. In fact, she apparently had quite a prominent voice. And she says, look at me. My brain works just fine. My voice works just fine. I'm following everything that's going on here today. And my brain is sending signals to my fingers and my toes and my arms and my legs, and they aren't listening. And so often this is the story of the church, that we are not discerning our head. We have a head who sits at the right hand of God who is guiding and directing his church to his good and perfect purposes. And not every church looks identical in that. And yet so often we aren't listening. Family, it is not my job to discern the will of the head for this church. That is a false understanding of the priesthood. I am just a part of the body. It is our responsibility as men and women filled by the Holy Spirit who helps us discern the will of the head together. And as we return from this season of coronavirus and we see more and more of one another, I ask the question, would you join me in discerning the will of the head for this next season of our church? For the past few years, we have been blessed to send out church plants. We've been blessed to have a ministry to refugees. And I can't help but wonder, is the Lord leading us to something more, something else, something different? Not to put those things aside, but what is he adding on? But are we listening together? Are we even together is my first question. Are we opening up our hearts? Are we asking the Spirit to give us wisdom? Are we discerning the will of the head together? Christ is head over the church. He sits at the right hand of God and he is speaking. The question is, are we listening? I want to invite you next Sunday, we are going to have a Pentecost prayer service where we are praying specifically for mission that we have already engaged in and for discernment on mission that the Lord will have for us in the coming weeks months, and years. Would you join us with open hearts? Would you join us with a sensitivity to the Spirit to listen to our head because he is speaking? In the ascension, we remember two things, that we have a Lord who rules over the earth, and that is a comfort because we know we rest in his loving and perfect hands, and it's a conviction, recognizing that we are called to conform to his will. And we have a head over this church. Would you listen to him with me? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are speaking. Holy Spirit, would you give us ears to hear and strength to respond as the body? Holy Spirit, as we remember your descent next week in Pentecost, would you speak loudly to your church about the mission you are calling us into or the mission you are calling us to double down on that you've already given. Would we listen to the head and respond? To the glory of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.